Now, better than a good fire. Smokeless, of course. That's coke, coal with the smoke taken out. But who'd have thought that taking the smoke out of coal would lead to the invention of the world's favourite vehicle? Beep, beep. The idea of a wheeled vehicle that could propel itself under its own power had existed since the earliest days of steam. This massive beam engine in Cornwall, one of many that powered the mines, isn't going anywhere. But its engineering inspired a brilliant Scotsman, William Murdoch, to create this. This is a replica of Murdoch's model, a top secret design for a vehicle that could pull carriages along the road. And like the massive beam engine, it uses a piston, this one's set inside the boiler, to power this overhead beam, which turns a cranked axle. Revolutionary. Murdoch carried on developing his model vehicle during the 1780s. And this is how we think it works. Fascinating, isn't it? Murdoch was a gifted Scotsman, working for the engineering empire of Bolton and Watt, and he was their agent down here in Cornwall. It was his job to make sure that the engines were erected properly on site and that none of their patents were infringed. But he was fascinated by high pressure steam. He carried out his trials at night. He found that the best ground was in the lane leading to the church. Unfortunately, one night, the vicar walking home was confronted by a fire breathing monster which he decided was the very devil himself. The vicar wasn't the only one who was upset. James Watt heard about the experiments and gave Murdoch a choice. Either lose his job or continue working with the greatest engineering company of the age. Murdoch chose job security, but he didn't stop him experimenting, this time extracting gas from coal. Extracting gas was something that Murdoch had experimented with since he was a lad in Scotland. He put hot coals in a kettle and then he'd fit a thimble over the end of a spout with a hole in it and then he would try and light the escaping gases. It was a sort of home chemistry set but it paid off. And he soon became so successful that he lit his own house. The first house lit by gas in the world. And Murdoch's employers soon turned gaslight into big business. From 1805, mills and factories were able to work shifts around the clock using their own gas generating plants. It wasn't long before everybody wanted the new light. Candles were out, gas was in. The bon viveur Sidney Smith enthused about the advantages of a home lit by gas. Better to eat dry bread by the splendour of gas than to dine on wild beef with wax candles. The only problem was that coal gas was a potentially lethal cocktail of methane, carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Fortunately, it had a natural bad egg smell, so at least you knew if you'd left the gas on. As demand for gaslighting grew, every town had to have a gas works. Coal gas became town gas. Here in Scotland, at Bigger Gas Works, built in 1839, Murdoch's experiments with coal in a kettle were turned into an industrial operation. It's a highly efficient cycle producing town gas. What you want to do is burn coal so that it gives off gas. So you do it in one of these, a retort, which is airtight. It doesn't combust, you just heat it enough for the gas to rise out of the retort. The way you heat it is here, the furnace. This is the producer and here's the clever thing. You use the coke 
which is the byproduct of producing the gas. Coke is coal with the smoke taken out, the original smokeless fuel. So you take hot coke and it's fed directly into the producer, into the furnace. The whole cycle continues. Brilliant. The retorts had to be filled with an even layer of coal. It's eight foot to the back of there, and each retort, each bed, would take four and a half tonnes a day. The idea is to get it as far back, and then... When you've got the back filled, you work your way forward to get an even layer. The stoker's job was further complicated by the fact that you've got different layers, upper, middle and lower in that set of retorts. So that determines the heat and the rate of gas production because of the proximity to the producer down there. So these are hotter and these are cooler. So very skilled indeed, really. The gas and what were called the liquors, the impurities, will continue on its way to further purification. The gas is pulled from the hydraulic main through a condenser, which cools it down and removes more impurities. These are the machines that do it. Basically, they're belt-driven pumps, exhausters they're called in the gas trade. It then comes on to this, one of the most extraordinary pieces of machinery in the entire industrial age, in my opinion. This is a scrubber, mm, misses. The idea in our computer-dominated nanotechnology world that the way to remove ammonia from gas is to scrub it with brushes underwater seems fantastic. But that's what machine does. Gas is bubbled through water and scrubbed by slowly revolving brushes. And this is how town gas was cleaned throughout the whole of its life as a fuel supply. Massive volumes of gas had to be stored every day and held for periods of peak demand. Christmas Day, for example, all those turkeys. This gas holder, originally constructed in 1858, but then modified, and that one, built in 1872. So if you ever wonder why your gasometer at home looks old, it's because it is. The ideal seal for the gas was water. This whole structure, which rises and falls, according to the amount of gas it held under pressure, like a large accumulator, has a water seal. If I put my hand down here, I can actually feel under the edge of this top cylinder. But of course, when you've produced all this lovely clean gas, you need to know how much you've made. But how do you measure a gas? Ah, you use a gas meter. Here's one. On the large side, isn't it? And very ornate, rather beautifully decorated. Proud, see? The gas meter was invented in 1817 by John Hallam of the Gaslight and Coke Company. This is a wet meter. It's half full of water. Gas is introduced, and the only way for it to escape is to turn a paddle, a wheel. That's calibrated and shows us a reading on these dials here. Now, that's brilliant for working out how much the gas company's produced, also very good for larger industrial customers, but not very good for domestic customers. Too big, see? So, what the gas companies did was charge people according to the number of gas jets they had in their house. So people just left them on all the time. Up there for thinking, down there for dancing. Ah, there we are. So in the 1850s they came up with the dry meter, much more practical for home use. Although in this case rather impractically situated in the bathroom. Excuse me, madam. Two, seven, eight. The production of town gas and its byproduct coke had been inspired by the creative genius of William Murdoch. 
but he was still passionate about vehicles, road vehicles, and his experiments inspired the production of the first coke-fired horseless omnibus. Paddington Station, this train terminates here, all change. The coming of the railways brought a new type of person to London. The commuter. But when you'd got to Paddington, on Isambard Kingdom Brunel's Great Western Railway, you still had four miles to go to get to the city. That way, you had a choice. You could get a hackney cab, which was the horse-drawn equivalent of today's taxi, or you got a horse-drawn omnibus or carriage, which could take hours. Or you walked. It was time for some competition from a steam-driven vehicle. 50 years after William Murdoch first dreamed of steam on the roads, another visionary, Walter Hancock, made it happen. This amazing replica of Walter Hancock's 1833 coke-driven horseless omnibus was built by Tom Brogdon, the driver there. And it, it's a fantastic vehicle. Walter Hancock was from a family of rubber manufacturers and a brilliant engineer, much unsung in my opinion. And he realised the benefits of having a coke-fired road vehicle. And in that, he was very, very much aligned with William Murdoch. He realised that coke is a smokeless fuel. Therefore, this has no chimney. It also has the other benefit of coke in that the fire will lie dormant like a blacksmith's forge until you activate it. And the activator in this case is this fan here. This vehicle is turbocharged. When it's moving, the fan rotates, putting a blast of air through the coke, further activating the heat and giving more energy. When it's idling, when it's stood still, the fan's not moving, so the fire will stay dormant. Perfect for an omnibus, which is constantly stopping and starting. It also has some other fantastic innovations. It has suspension, one of the first road vehicles of its time to have a swinging arm like that pivoted, fixed axle, much the same as the modern Ford Explorer. Honestly, <coughs> this is the simplest steam engine I've ever seen to fire. You just hoy the coke in. Like that. Built in 1833, this vehicle could do 16 miles per hour. That's not much slower than modern buses. But at that time, it was competing with horse omnibuses, which was big business. Hold tightly, please. The main competitor was a man called George Shillibeer, who ran a fleet of horse-drawn buses. And this is a bit of a wolf in sheep's clothing, because Hancock designed the carriage to actually look like a Shillibeer omnibus, so as he wouldn't alarm his passengers. But the competition was too fierce. Horse buses were one man operated. This needed three men. So, coke driven road vehicles never caught on. And eventually, of course, their passengers travelled by underground. For William Murdoch's vision of self powered road vehicles, it looked like the end of the road. But all was not lost. Since the 17th century, inventors had been experimenting with new ways of driving a piston inside a cylinder. It all started with a bang. Are we ready? Pull! Pull! If you have an explosion in an enclosed space, like a gun barrel, it will force whatever's in the barrel out of the end. If you put a piston in the way, so the explosion acts on the piston, you have an early form of internal combustion engine. The problem with using gunpowder as a fuel is that once it's exploded, 
you then have to recharge it. So what do you do? Stop and put more gunpowder in? Not very good. 200 years later, Murdoch's coal gas was readily available. It could be fed into an engine and ignited again and again and again. By 1878, a German, Nicholas Otto, had invented a highly efficient gas engine. It had a horizontal cylinder and worked on a four-stroke system. Each stroke is a movement of the piston up and down the cylinder. Here's the inlet and the exhaust valves. So the first stroke pulls the gas into the engine. It is then compressed, ignited, and then the exhaust valve opens and the waste gases are expelled and then you're back to the starting point. It's the internal combustion engine. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Suck, squeeze, bang, blow. Over and over again. Gas engines had one major advantage over steam engines. They were very quick to start. And the residents of Cambridge had a particular need for quick starting engines. Like most British towns in the 19th century, Cambridge had a big problem. Raw sewage. On a visit, Queen Victoria remarked on the amount of paper in the picturesque River Cam, all suspiciously about the same size. A quick-witted councillor replied, Notices prohibiting swimming, ma'am. These two venerable but elegant and oh so sophisticated old ladies were installed in 1894. Beautiful steam engines that lifted the raw sewage and foul water that drained into a sump under this building. 40 feet down there. At each stroke they raised 150 gallons, forced it through 24 inch pipes to a sewage farm down there. But they were very labour intensive and steam had to be raised in a boiler house, another room over there, and that could take a couple of days. Steam engines were excellent for coping with the day-to-day -day needs of the Cambridge sewage system, but the engine man had to keep a very careful watch for rain, because Cambridge is on the fens. It's in low-lying land, and a flash flood could be potentially disastrous and for coping with that you needed something that will respond very very quickly this is what you need gas engines internal combustion engines they're a different class of beasts to the elegant ladies upstairs. They can supply explosive power. They're big, strong, brute force, almost instantaneously. These two national gas engines were installed in 1909 and generate 94 horsepower each. They ran from the town gas supply, generated at the gas works just over there where Tesco's is now. Let's start them up. First, prime the engine with the gas and air mixture. It's a bit like tickling the carb on your lawnmower. Then, the magneto. Oh, you smell that gas. That was a low voltage magneto. What, what happens is that instead of having a fixed interval, like a spark plug, you actually have two little electrodes that come apart and pull the spark across them. And that fires it. And now we're off. What we've got here is the suck, squeeze, bang and blow cycle of the internal combustion engine. Here's an eccentric here. This can's just knocking that there and that's opening the exhaust valve. Here, another one. That's the gas inlet. And on the end here, off centre there, that's just flicking your low voltage magneto. Beautiful, all within the 
at the space of two feet. And here, you've got the governor, this is also the accelerator. It's familiar, isn't it? Governor, accelerator, inlet valve, exhaust valve, magneto. Boop, boop. Boop, boop. But before the internal combustion engine could get out on the road, it had to be set free from its umbilical gas supply. It needed a new fuel. And in 1882, Gottlieb Daimler invented a carburetor that turned petrol into a vapour, which could act just like a gas. All the technology was now available. The race was on to develop a really effective internal combustion motor car. Love that little noise when it just engages. Ting. There we are. Hill start. Early motor cars was much about style as engineering. Ah, second. Well done. This beautiful 1898 Peugeot was owned by Sir David Salomons, Tunbridge Wells. And in 1896, he drafted an act for Parliament called the Emancipation Act. And after that, cars no longer had to travel behind a man carrying a red flag. Next stop, Brighton. For the pioneers, there were no rules. Armand Peugeot started with a two-cylinder Daimler engine, but then designed his own and put it at the back of the car. Using a 360-degree crank, the cylinders worked in unison, so you got a very smooth ride. The circle is now complete. William Murdoch tried to design a self-propelled steam carriage. His experiments with gas led to the gas engine, which led to the internal combustion engine, which led to modern cars.